Discourse. I'm your host, Michael Dooney. I finally managed to finish editing my interview with Sophie Damask from September 2018. Sophie was in Berlin for the European Month of Photography, together with Kate Robertson and Derek Kreckler, who she also mentions in this podcast, and you can listen to in their respective previous recordings. We first exhibited Sophie's work at Jarvis Dooney in 2016, coincidentally with Kate Robertson and another emerging artist, Jacqueline Ball. At the time, Sophie was living and working in Paris. She's now back in Canberra, so it was really good to catch up while she was over in Berlin. We speak about the new work she's been making, as well as science fiction, post-humanism and photo books. So without further delay, let's listen to the interview. I reviewed your work yes. years and years and years yes. ago. Yes, <laughs> that's what I was I was telling De- um, Derek about the joys of portfolio reviews and I was like, yeah. they are good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How did your reviews go on the weekend actually? Um, yeah, like some went really well, others not great. Kirsten, I don't know if I should mention her, but Kirsten Stahl, she was a really interesting one. Christiana Stahl. Christiana Stahl, okay, that's what, <laughs> Christiana Stahl. She was a really interesting one, because I kind of wish I'd had her first. Yeah. Because I knew that my work wasn't going to appeal to her, because it's very colourful and conceptual, and it's not at all photo um, documentary, but mm-hmm. there is, like, an element of truth in through, by telling it through a fictive narrative. And her feedback was kind of the most constructive in terms of how to present and talk to other people about my work and I found that all the reviews I've had after her went really well oh that's good (laughs) yeah um the peer on peer review at Somos was really interesting so that was last night that was the night night before before, Mm -hmm. um with Pascal Glissman and some of the artists there who were doing their residencies it was really good it was probably the most kind of intellectually stimulating Mm-hmm. While they're reviewing my work, you kind of, when you're in a review, you don't necessarily always absorb straight away. You're kind of standing there a little bit like a deer in the headlights because you've just opened yourself up and kind of you have what people are saying hitting, um, hitting you. And so what I always like to do is to then afterwards write down what everyone said. Because you're not going to remember unless you do that because I think your brain kind of goes into shut down defensive mode sometimes when you open yourself up like that. But as I was on the tram home, I was going over some of the feedback that I'd gotten. And I think also in line with Kate's talk, I found that like ethics is starting, that's definitely something that's starting to kind of rise up in terms of people's practices. And it made me reflect on my current project that I'm working on. So when you say ethics, what do you mean? Um, so the project that I'm working on at the moment involves human hair mm-hmm. and my work as a collective body deals with the cycles of consumption, destruction and creation and how they intertwine and you can't really have one without the other two. And I hadn't really thought too much about necessarily the fact that some of the hair I was getting from was over the internet commercially from strangers. Like the only thought that I had given to it was the fact that that hair mixed in with my hair and the hair of some of my female friends and acquaintances, it creates mass. It kind of creates the idea of a group of people or a group kind of evolving and mutating. And it plays in with the idea of the fact that hair doesn't actually contain DNA. It contains information, but the DNA comes from the sebum. When you buy hair extensions, you don't have any sebum. So you're not actually buying that person's DNA. You are buying information about them including environmental information of what they're eating, what toxins are in that food, have they taken certain kinds of drugs, which you can do testing using mm-hmm. that. So it's, I guess with hair, it's more of a snapshot of time. Yes, that's all, yeah. Okay. Because I, when I've seen the pictures, I just assumed that it was your hair. No, it's, it's um, yeah, it's a lot of it are extensions. When I first started the project, the first extensions I used were extensions that I actually had bought when I was about 14, 15, when I um, very much wanted to look like an anime character. And so I had these really long hair extensions that I would put in to kind of make myself look as alien as possible. And I used those extensions in with some of my own hair in the first couple of installations. And then as the project grew, more women were willing to give me their hair and so I've got a couple of bags of hair from female friends but as the installations have gotten larger I've bought more hair commercially online. How did this start then? Because I know some of your early work is more to do with like the universe and galaxies and I guess the kind of chemical process in your earlier projects but with this one what drew you initially to saying because you install hair in the natural environment like the yeah. pictures I've seen are in the forest or in the bush in Australia and you've integrated hair in the natural environment. Yeah it's chemically processed hair so that's the element that I haven't talked about is that I hand dye and chemically process the hair myself mm-hmm. and so the project came about 
about at first when I lost my studio access I kind of found myself not being able to work on the project I wanted to work on but wanting to do something and so I turned my camera back outside and around that same time I was looking into some of the research that's being done on the link between infertility and autoimmune diseases and exposure to environmental toxins. So the series talks about how we're poisoning our environment and how our environment is back in turn and poisoning us. So there is a little bit of chemistry and alchemy in that. Because your background is initially in science, isn't it? Not as an artist or as a sculptor or a photographer. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. So I didn't do science at university. It's mm-hmm. something that I've started to do a bit of now. But I did my student internship at Questacon, in the National Science Centre. That was in Australia. Yeah, yeah. In, a, in Australia and Canberra, where I taught very basic scientific principles and laws to young children. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of my earlier installations are actually using those same chemical reactions that I would kind of teach to young children. And I then took them and I guess appropriated them into a slightly more adult concept, but also wanting to have that kind of playful childish nature that you engage with it in a way where you can learn from it. Yeah. Do you still teach or do you do stuff with kids still? Um, No, not unfortunately. (laughs) I'd love to (laughs) do it again, but yeah, at the moment, no. Okay. And I think when we first met, you were living in Paris. Yes. So when did you go from, I guess, to kind of go a few steps backwards, you were, so Questacon, were you in uh, Quest, Australia? Uh, Questacon, it's where I did my um, student internship at the end of my studies. So mm-hmm. in Canberra, I think it works differently to the rest of the state. We call year 11 and 12 college. Mm-hmm. And you have the options that when you're in year 11 and 12, you can do go do these internship programs with institutions. Okay. And then directly after that? You relocated or? Uh, directly after that, I I went to the University of Canberra where I studied briefly journalism and international relations. That's how I got into photography. Of um, I started taking photographs for the uni magazine. It was, I photographed a martial arts tournament and then those photos got used in an international martial arts magazine. People started to talk to me about the fact that I should be concentrating more on the, pho- the, photog- the photography part of my journalistic pr- practice, which worked for me because I wasn't actually enjoying the journalistic part of it for ethics reasons Um, (laughs) and then I then did my next studies in Paris and that's this that's the diploma that I um I graduated with honors Mm -hmm. with the Spears Photography Institute my first term I was very much photojournalistic still concentrated and then I got introduced into working in, in a studio and after that I kind of got consumed with the idea of creating installations and creating worlds from the ground up. So you had a studio whilst you were in Paris? Yeah, I um I made my own studio in my apartment that was in the outskirts of Paris in Ivory. Wow. And how long were you there for? Because I only realised recently that you were back in Canberra. We were yeah. back in Australia. I was there for a little over five years. Wow, okay. Yes, yeah, so it was a yeah, it was the majority of my adult life so far. So. Yeah. How has it been since shifting back to Canberra or moving um, back? Because I, I can't think of anybody else actually that's had like a long term experience over here that has then gone back to Australia. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange. I kind of I was talking to um, Kate a little bit about it last night. She's just relocated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, how human that kind of that kind of tribalism is of when you leave the tribe and then you come back and every yeah. like universal everyone's kind of like. I mean, I'm what are you about doing here? <laughs> yeah. It is quite funny because it's. I think it's just universal in our species how we are. Um, we have that kind of group mentality of. I found that I was very welcome when I'd visit, mm-hmm. and then when I moved back to Canberra, there was this kind of sense: "Oh, you're here. You're staying. <laughs> <laughs> you sure about this?" <laughs> and to answer that question, I'm not. <laughs> um, but I. It has made me appreciate Australia quite a bit, and even this trip here to Berlin and Amsterdam, it's made me realise that as much as we kind of, in a, when you're in Australia, you complain about a lot of things revolving around identity politics and ethics mm-hmm. and cultural appropriation. We have so much more evolved <laughs> in that area than in Europe. I think like we've talked before about in the idea of inclusivity mm-hmm. and how that means something very different here than it does in Australia. And I think 
moving back to Australia, that's one of the things that I've been kind of struck by. In saying that, all of the art that I like to engage with is art that very much is about opening a conversation and not necessarily shutting it down. Um, you find in Australia it's more the kind of shut down, or here is. I think the other way. I think both places do both, but in very different ways. Yeah. Like um, here, the power structures are much more entrenched. I think it's a bit more narrow. The people who are buying art and so what they're giving value to. Well, in Australia, I think it's a little bit more open in that way. But in saying that, the two markets work very differently. Yeah, yeah. I mean they're different sizes, and I think even yeah. though we don't have the same history in Australia. Yeah, that's like, it's still uh, quite new. Yeah, that's. I was thinking about that when I was doing printing about the fact that the printers that I worked with in Paris they're like a three gen three um three gen generations of grandfather father son wow. and I was like Canberra's just over a hundred years old yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's not enough room in there for three generations of of printers yeah so this trip has been quite inspiring for you, you it's how has it been then reflecting on having five years here because you've been back for a year and a half now or just over a year um yeah I went back for a couple of months and then I went back to Europe to kind of pack up and then move back and mm-hmm. so it's been about almost just a little bit over a year yeah I found this trip really I found it really useful because um I think one of I also don't want to do down Australia because when I was younger, I definitely had that mentality of get out, get um, get out as fast as you can. And having gotten out and then gone back, I see that we have a lot to offer. And yeah. I think that we're quite insecure about what we have to offer and we don't really realize what we have to offer that. And I found showing my photos, which are all now set within, or for this project, are set within an Australian landscape mm-hmm. to Europeans that trying to explain necessarily the connection of Australians to their landscape is quite different than here in Europe because Australia, we have our, the, indi- the indigenous po- population and their community and their culture and their relationship to the landscape. And then you have the rest of the population, which is at heart an immigrant culture. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's one of the things that makes, I think, Australia quite special is that immigrant culture, it's a hodgepodge. <laughs> Of different yeah. cultures which have been stuck together and I think that's quite beautiful and I think that's what makes Australian artists quite interesting because they have so many different influences that we might not even be aware of just because we grew up in a culture. I think, yeah, yeah. the point you made about the landscape, I didn't appreciate that until I left either. I think growing up it's just an intrinsic thing that you just know the bush is there, the ocean is there, the desert, the landscape, like everything yeah. is there and it's kind of always there in your subconscious. But then when it's not there you feel a lack. You're like, whoa, I need I need this. I need yeah. the nature now. And I didn't realise that I needed it. Yeah, I found two years in Paris, I found myself taking off my shoes in a park and just <laughs> putting my feet on grass and being like, this is nice. Yeah. This is... But I've noticed as well um, with all the work that we've shown and the different artists that we've worked with that there is a different connection to the landscape that isn't always obvious to us, I think. And I guess when you're in Australia and you're only ever seeing it, it's the same when you're only ever in Europe and you're surrounded by thousands of years of history, you forget. Yeah, it's, I think that's we get kind of comfortable mm-hmm. in a bubble and we kind of stop necessarily appreciating what's around us. I have found with this trip it's interesting seeing how people engage with the photos because they're kind of, they're drawn to the landscape and then they're partly repelled by the grotesque kind of nature of the human hair mm-hmm. that's been installed in them. Conceptually it's a little bit confronting for some people because it does deal with the idea of poison and infertility, post-human issues of empathy and being able to empathize with the environment and the fact that an ecology, it's, it's something that's it's evolving it's not stagnant yeah it's not necessarily something that we have control over as much as we like to think we might be able to control it it's it's still going to do its own thing even if we as a species are no longer around have you found that with your work when you're speaking with people that would identify otherwise as quite open-minded and progressive Mm -hmm. if there's certain ideas that cause them to question how they're living yeah, infertility was definitely one. I don't like to talk too much about how my personal life relates to my projects. Mm-hmm. I want people to be able to engage with them without necessarily having to think too much about me. But like, it does come from a personal place. I found it quite interesting how it makes some people shut down because it's also not just women, it's also men. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of recent studies being done that there are declining sperm counts due to things like 
pollution and the way we're living. The hair project I've only seen small samples of, so I guess it's still very much in development at the moment. Yeah, at the moment there's at least two more installations out in the landscape that I want to do. I then, I've recently gained back studio access and I want to re-explore that within a slightly more sterile setting, reflecting on some of Kate's work and how she was very much aware of the ethics about going into this community and using a technology which has been used against them beforehand and using it in a open way that invites them in but reflecting on the fact that there is this colonial past of going into areas and taking trophies and putting them on the wall yeah. and this idea of control and power by capturing it and so I want to explore how we engage with those kinds of scientific trophies and how we're also willing to accept who is an, an authority on knowledge, the kind of voices and the tone they use of how we're willing to listen. Yeah. So with what you've been doing back home, are you doing a lot more writing now? It does feel as though your practice is becoming more research-based in a way that is actually contributing to something, given some of the topics that you're looking into and your background in science which you've built on with your photography, yeah. do you have a two-pronged approach to what you're doing? Like you have your aesthetic output, Definitely. you have your conceptual yeah. work that's engaging with the community, but then how much of an overlap is there or have you found so far? Because the project's still in its baby stages and I took a risk deciding to show it. <laughs> this trip during the portfolio Mm -hmm. reviews because it's still very much in those baby stages. And I don't regret that because I exposed it while it's still in the baby stages in both those two prongs, in the aesthetic Mm -hmm. and in the research space. Like the research... To a certain extent, I am relying on the scientists who are actually doing that research and I'm responding to the research that they've been doing. So actually in the last week and a half that I've been in Europe, there have been two lots of papers released exploring the area in which I'm doing those those photographs. I won't go too much into it because it's quite a a dense topic, but some of the photos that I have so far taken in the project contain landscapes where glyphosate is being used. The the Monsanto chemical that's now been confirmed by the World Health Organization as a cancer cancer genic. And it's also Roundup, which is the pesticide which it's contained, which is used very widely in Australia, has now been linked to declining honeybees. And that's all information that's come public knowledge within the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. While preparing my portfolio, I was (laughs) I saw that and realized. And so one of the feedbacks I did get was they were like, you need to condense this down. And I was like, I know, but more research is... So I find that really interesting of that. And I think that's where a little bit of my journalistic background, even though I I went to Paris instead of finishing that degree, kind of plays in of you need to respond to what's happening. Mm -hmm. You have your concept, but you also, you can't allow yourself to stagnate in it. You need to kind of (laughs) respond to what people are doing around you and kind of flow with it a little bit. In terms of the aesthetic, I definitely am doing experimentation. I, um, I love paper. Some of the reasons why I love photo books just because there's something magical in being able to hold another universe within your hands and that's what photo books make available and it's slightly more accessible because they're not necessarily as expensive as buying print but I can say as someone who just went to a photo book fair be careful (laughs) (laughs) yeah because they're quite addictive as well but I love paper and so I've been experimenting with making my own paper and I've been experimenting with making that paper out of the chemically processed human hair as well as the grass that has been treated with the glyphosate that's leading to my practice is moving into a slightly more sculptural aspect of its entering the 3D of um, different ways to incorporate the hair into the paper. Wow, okay. Because yeah. I remember when we showed some of your work here before, you said you were working on, or you had a project that you wanted to show that was very much sculptural sculptural, or yeah. even performative, like it, it was very site-specific. Yeah, um, now that I've got my studio back, I'm hoping to explore that project a little more. In terms of the research behind it, it's not necessarily going to change because it was very, it was, again, going back to... Scientific experiments originally designed for children. Mm-hmm. It's exploring the different melting rates of different liquids based on their density. It was actually funny. I'm listening to Derek talk the other night because he was talking about his ice cream and the separation of water and fat. And yeah. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's um, it's a, that's a really interesting topic at the moment because we are at a period where I think one of the last estimates done of we have two years to get our act together when it comes to global warming, and after that, it's 
I think everyone's going to be a lot more interested in Elon Musk's plan to go to Mars. Right. <laughs> um, but then again, it's kind of like if we can't look after our own planet, should we really allow ourselves to be trusted with another one? Is the... Yeah. And there's that many parts of the Earth. I mean, Mars isn't inhabitable. Yeah. <laughs> We're well, going to have yeah. to do a bit of work there. Why don't we do that work here? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There are enough places here that you can't live. Let's make those places livable Yeah. <laughs> before we try and start again somewhere else. Yeah, it's, it is funny how I, we, as a kind of species, we're kind of like, oh. Yeah, this one's broken. We'll throw that away and find it. Yeah, I one. feel like, and that's kind of very much reflective on how we broke <laughs> this one of, um, yeah, I saw one of the kind of please, uh, public pleas in terms of landfills was, please do not give fast fashion garments that you would not wear yourself or give to friends to charities. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Because the amount of clothes that they're having to put in landfills is it's outrageous. And that comes a bit down to the idea of fibers and what you're releasing back into the environment. Because I don't think people often reflect on the fact that your clothes contain a lot of it, like a lot of chemical information that you're then putting that out into the environment, like little plastic spores, mm-hmm. polyester, which is an interesting conversation as well in terms of what you're putting back out there and how that's going to come back and bite us. Your work is very current and it's dealing with a lot of contemporary issues that are relevant to everybody. The danger with a lot of contemporary art is it's very inward looking and yeah. that's for a lot of people it's a form of therapy and they're dealing with various issues yeah. and their art is a way of way of understanding that. Whereas I feel like with a lot of your stuff, especially learning now more about the project that you're doing with the hair, it is looking out into the community and thinking, what are the issues that we're currently being faced with and how can we how can we raise awareness and hopefully make changes? Yeah, I would say that my my work, sometimes when I look back on it or someone who um, is very close to me will look at what I've named a photo and they'll be like, mm. <laughs> they'll be like, mean? <laughs> um, I'd say that there's definitely a lot of my personal, like particularly one of the reasons why I started to research into infertility and autoimmune diseases comes from a very personal place. But I think one of the things of that is that why it's so outwards is that that's something that's growing at alarming rates within the Western developed world. Yeah. And it's, it's something yeah. that's never spoken about. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot of different things, and I think especially especially for women. There's a lot of different things that we just don't talk about. Yeah, I think infertility is a really interesting one. That's something I was being quite shocked by this trip is how people shut down so fast. Yeah. The moment you mentioned that word. As a young, like, as a woman in her late 20s, approaching 30, there is, there is that kind of pressure of you talk to people and they, they want to know, are you in a partnership? Are you settling down? And when mm-hmm. I respond and I'm kind of like, not really. Yeah. <laughs> At the moment, I'm very much concentrated on this and they'll either say, oh, you of time and that could be I, I know it comes from a good place but it can be a little bit condescending because it's a bit kind of like well maybe I'm going to allocate that time somewhere else yeah. and there's like and I, I have a lot of respect and I'm not saying that I'm not interested in having children because that's a really personal issue that each woman should deal with and each individual should deal with but there is this kind of expectation that as a young woman your value kind of comes down to your fertility and your willingness to kind of fit that role and so I have found that as a young woman presenting work that deals with issues of infertility some people respond in quite strong ways and I don't think they're always aware that they're responding. I didn't realize how confronting it was because it's something that I've been thinking about for about the last two years Yeah, and so that's why the trip was quite good because it pulled me out of my own head and gave me a bit more of a perspective of how other people are going to respond to these issues because infertility is a really good, it's like one of those really primal things that and I don't, I know know as a woman we often talk about deconstructing misogyny we often think about it in men and i don't think we think too much about deconstructing our own internalized misogyny what you said that kind of therapy i often i feel sometimes when i'm engaging with work like that there is that therapeutic aspect needing to release Mm -hmm. And I think that's really good, but I think it's also, and I think that making that kind of work can be really interesting because then a couple of years later you can look back at it and you can kind of reflect on it and become a little bit self-aware. But I do sometimes think that a lot of the anger, like it's, you need to get it out so it doesn't become toxic, but you also need to kind of become a little bit self-aware and be like, well, I need to validate myself before I can get validation elsewhere. Yeah. When you put it like that as well, I think it may be because Okay, if other people are dealing with various, let's say, people are dealing with mental health issues, yeah. that's easy to say, that doesn't affect me. But 
until you're, I guess, until you're in a position to decide, do I want to have children? That ability or inability is a real, you know, that's a real concern. It's like, I've never had to think about this. Yeah. And now I do have to think about but it. it. It's, <laughs> and it's a, it's a really scary, um, it's a quite a scary question because we live in a, there's never been a non-interesting time, but we do, we are in a very unique position in history of there's mass extinctions happening around us on an unpre- on an unprecedented level mm-hmm. of our experience of Earth. <laughs> like, yeah. like it's happened before, but we weren't around to see it. And we have definitely con- contributed to that. I find that to be quite interesting because one of the last installations I did is called Venus. Mm-hmm. It's named after the Milo de Venus. It's a, it's a burnt tree in a very Australian landscape. <laughs> um, yeah. But it doesn't actually look like it's been photographed in Australia was, which was one of the feedbacks that I've been given by people, which is interesting. I think it's the choice of light. It's a burnt tree and I have draped a lot of human hair into the tree and it's um, mm. pink hair that's been chemically processed. And it's quite toxic. And for me, it's quite a beautiful image, but it's also quite grotesque. One of the reasons why that landscape has been burnt is because in Australia we do back burning to try and prevent bushfires. Yeah. Before I took that image, I was very interested about Venus. Why have we used the word Venus? Why is that asso- associated with women? And I looked into the history of the planet Venus and the fact there's a there's a lot of research showing that it wasn't as hot and scorched as it currently is. That one of the reasons why that happened was due to greenhouse gases. And we don't know if there was a human-like life form that inhabited that planet and mm. um, created those greenhouse gases. So there's something, there's something that happened. And so obviously Earth has has its own natural cycles but we've we've sped it up yeah and so i think it's interesting to look outwards at other planets and also what their history is and that's why science fiction is quite fascinating because there's this fictive narratives where there's kind of kernels of truth yeah i mean did you do also look into greek mythology where yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> the, like the, the goddess of love <laughs> yeah. yeah i find it i just find it interesting how art and science culturally they kind of they intertwine in ways which we just take for granted we don't go but kind of like oh we're using this word to describe this but we've also used it to describe this and this is the kind of factual nature yeah we, yeah we forget yeah. its original origin that's just the word we apply to that thing now yeah yeah that is one of the interesting feedbacks that i've gotten during this trip was the use of text because there's that kind of debate do you name an artwork or do you leave it as an untitled I love Cindy Sherman. She's one of my idols, and I always find it interesting how she left them very much untitled, even though the image themselves were titled. But I've found that the narratives that I construct and some of the other art that I like to interact with, I like reading the title because I like looking at the image, and then I like reading the title and going back. For me, it reflects again back on that kind of looking back to how we would photograph images and label them and then put them on the wall and kind of being like, this is this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. how has it been then because you mentioned veganism now you after doing some of the other projects looking into the processes you thought i should probably become a vegan if i'm doing this yeah i know myself that's also quite a confronting topic for other people and when you were saying about the infertility issue people were like well no stop i don't want to talk about this yeah it's definitely they're definitely intertwined actually they're not unrelated for me because i find that veganism is definitely linked to comes down to empathy for me and a lot of my work deals with this idea of post-humanism mm-hmm. like the series with the hair is definitely entering that realm of, of mutation and evolution and I find a lot of people who are confronted by post-humanism they find the idea of empathizing with life not just animals but also with the ecosystem that they're part of quite confronting and I yeah. think when people are debating with you about veganism they're like but we eat meat that's what we do we, we have to destroy to create to life and it's like well we've actually evolved to a point where we don't need to do that yeah. <laughs> um, or they'll shift it and say but what about people in the developing world are you telling them they should go vegan it's like no if the Inuits want to hunt whales yeah. <laughs> that's okay like yeah, yeah. they're not farming them on an industrial scale yeah it is the industrialization <laughs> aspect of it that's that is really interesting with photography as a medium because the industrialization of photography of creating all of these images and how do you comes back down to art how do you make images Images which mean something, mm-hmm. that they have value, they have um, knowledge which has some kind of value to everyone around you. It's also quite difficult because with veganism, it's one of those things that's always been kind of seen as a subculture and it's just starting to kind of enter mainstream kind of consciousness, Mm -hmm. which is really great. But it means that if you've been making work which deals with it, I think it's only now just starting to find a voice that people are willing to listen to. 
Oh, I had only discovered recently that vegetarianism was rebranded. To be a vegetarian in the 60s and the 70s meant yeah. that you didn't eat any animal products. But then, obviously, that's not good for the dairy industry. So it's like, well, you can still have eggs and milk. That's okay. It's like, okay. And then now we needed a new word. Yeah, it's... um, <laughs> It is... It's interesting because, like, as an Australian at the moment, we're in drought. And there's a lot of talk about supporting your local dairy farmers and supporting your local farmers and what I'm about to say may possibly get my email or Facebook hacked. <laughs> um, and there's been a lot of posts about how veganism as you know it's hurting is hurting our farmers and well life moves forward one of the really horrible brutal things about life you have you have to you have to adapt so if we're if in Australia is a particular case I think some areas of the states might have a similar structure on an ecology level because we droughts happen yeah, <laughs> like, really. yeah. yeah and so maybe we need to start thinking about how we can adapt our farming practices to work more in line with the environment instead of fighting against it and if we live in an environment which can't can no longer support industrial levels of, of dairy farming then mm. maybe we need to look into other avenues yeah no i completely agree i think i've seen a lot of examples of this kind of thing where we're trying to grow things in an area that's dry so we just put more and more water there yeah, or well, we try and we try to modify that environment to sustain something that isn't sustainable so yeah, we're it's, always going to be on the back foot here we can't yeah. ever win it's kind of like going to mars um i think it's quite interesting taking it in a more aesthetic and less conceptual <laughs> direction or if you look at australian landscapes and i think to europeans there's something very alien there's very there's an element of the other mm-hmm in them, I think maybe because it is a landscape which it was not designed on an ecological level to support large populations of human <laughs> beings. And there's definitely that. One of the reasons why I like landscape, Australian landscape photography, is because there is that element in it of we are very much the alien. As an Australian, I feel I am the alien within the, alien, the yeah. Australian landscape. <laughs> well, I find it funny showing those photographs to Europeans because they see the landscape as the alien. And that's been one of the really contrasting points of view that I've come across of. I found myself explaining colonial Australian history to a bunch of Germans who kind yeah. of been like, no, 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 I am the other. Yeah. <laughs> like, I am the alien. <laughs> and one of the ways that I've been exploring it recently in this project is through the serrated tussocks grass it's a i i think it's north american but i'd want to fact check that but it's an invading species of grass in australia that's Mm -hmm. kind of wreaking um, havoc on the local ecosystem because it can populate up to 95 percent of the area that inhabits and it competes with the local power tussock Mm -hmm. um poa sorry poa tussock grasses which for instance are the favorite food of wombats and that's some more research I need to do is looking into how that grass was introduced into the Australian landscape, but the serrated tussocks grass is the grass that's being treated with the glyphosate. Oh, right. To and keep growing? Or, oh, no, no, to get rid of it. it. To okay. kill it. So when I first started to do the research into that and seeing the politics around it of seeing that there's good intentions because we're trying to protect the ecosystem, but in doing that, we're also we're also poisoning it. Yeah. And um, one of the interesting articles I was actually reading last week, just before one of my portfolio reviews, and was thinking, oh, my God, how maybe do I... I leave it out <laughs> um, or do I talk about this is kind of the latest point that we are with this is that some local indigenous firemen have been um, backburning as a way to kind of control invading pests and which is obviously like it's a much more natural approach to then using um, a pesticide and it's kind of, but it's kind of interesting that it's taken us this long to start to investigate that avenue and I feel like that comes from a real a western bias and how we it's so easy for us to disregard a non-western point of view when it comes to science and that's one of the things that I really have en- enjoyed about talking to Kate and looking at her project of that um there's all of these untapped wells of knowledge and information that we haven't necessarily been willing to listen to mm-hmm. or we overlook yeah. because i think in i think certainly with the australian landscape a lot of plants need the fire before they can germinate yeah, like with the different seeds like they need the heat for the for the next process to happen yeah which is one of the reasons why we live in a, a an environment which has cycles of drought because the landscape needs to get dry so it can burn <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um which, as someone who lives in Australia, I'm not looking forward to this summer because it's predicted to be one of the worst well, fire sum- seasons. Yeah, yeah, I can believe it because this year in Berlin and I guess throughout Europe, it's been like the hottest summer. It's been the hottest summer in the 10 years I've lived here. And a lot of yeah. people have said it's it's um, it's unusual for the weather to be like this. And then I'm immediately thinking, okay, so what's going to happen in Australia this year? Because it's, it's always hot anyway. Yeah, but how I often see it 
is like as that when I'm in Australia and I'm kind of alone in the bush, I get that real feeling of sometimes I feel the bush is kind of being like, hello, small pest. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Especially when I'm walking around with my bags of human hair and kind of (laughs) putting it into lungs, wanting to know when it's going to kind of send a, a spider or a snake to kind of eradicate me. I do kind of feel like the earth is maybe kind of saying, you guys have done a real bad job. Yeah. Maybe it's time. <laughs> that, like, and that's kind of what that project is talking about, how our environmental footprint is eventually a foot is going to come and make an imprint on us. <laughs> like, yeah. And yeah, it certainly feels like that. Yeah. We're kind of getting to a, a critical point. Yeah, and there's so many there's so many interesting philosophical discussion around that at the moment, which I feel like in... Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that before I go to where that next popped up in my brain. Um mm-hmm. Was there's I say it's, it's Henderson's filter theory of this idea of one of the reasons why we haven't found alien other intelligent alien life form to interact with is because maybe one of the stages we need to get to is have the ability to wipe ourselves out and to have not done that and I feel like we haven't necessarily proved that and I think global warming is a really good mm-hmm. example of that. And I find it interesting that there are there is intellectuals in communities discussing this and trying to get it out there, but like kind of as a populist, we're not interested in hearing it. And on a political level, it's being shut down. Like you can see, particularly in Australia, you can see funding being diverted away from those people. So what do you mean again? So it's kind of the research into eradication of the human race species, or that, or filter through the idea that for us to be able to contact with other with a with other like life forms mm-hmm. in space is that there are certain te- technological advances that need to be made for us to be able to see them or for them to be oh, able to right. see okay, us yeah. and one of them is possibly the ability to have to be advanced to the point where you can wipe yourself out and having not done that mm-hmm. well i guess that's a lot of the debate around artificial intelligence at yeah the moment, isn't it? it and is, when um, the when the machines can learn and improve upon themselves we kind of make ourselves obsolete, don't we? Yeah, yeah. It's an yeah, it's an interesting. I haven't I haven't done too much readings in, into that. I've there's some really interesting stuff done, and particularly how it's transferring a little bit over into the arts as well. Mm. Um, it is it is because it, it then kind of opens up that world of maybe we won't be here, but the machines we made, <laughs> like, and that's a very post human um topic. Of, yeah. yeah. But then I, I had a I had a lecturer who once said I was talking to him on. Um, he was um, a math lecturer. I was talking to him about of we were like looking into algorithms and how you um how you design them and I was like, Oh my god, we're we are we are creating our end and he was like the algorithms are only ever as good as the human being who made them. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which does create this voice of hell hope. If a human being made that algorithm, there's a human being who can unmake that algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the thing, yeah. Yeah, so we are we are amazing as a species in that way because we are that self aware. Yeah, I for the environment, I'm I'm really interested in it because it's something that we're uncomfortable with. We see it in our politicians of they don't want to necessarily acknowledge. Well, I think yeah. even how you were saying before about the dairy farming and everything else, like if we get to a point where it's... I mean, for me, the reason I switched to being a vegan is because yeah. now that I know this information, I can't not know it. Yeah, you, you have to sleep at night. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, And I think even if you're talking about scientific research and policy, it's like if we look into this and we find out something that we don't want to know, then There's, we can't annoy it, we can't avoid yeah, it, we Australia can't ignore it. In Australia... <laughs> And Australia politically at the moment is in a place where this research is being done and it's just either not being given a voice or like by having its funding cut or just being kind of buried. Yeah. It's going to be interesting where we go, where if they're in 50, 100 years, people are going to be looking back and being like, why didn't they do something? Did no one know? And then people did know they yeah. were. <laughs> but there is, and that's kind of where the tribalism of not being willing to have a conversation of everyone so stuck in their own camp mm-hmm. and being unwilling to engage because it's at this point it's not really about being right and that's one of the way why photography is quite interesting as a medium to communicate information because a photograph can't really be a truth <laughs> no yeah someone's picked a yeah. The perspective they've chosen everything about it yeah, yeah. um and so it's, it's going to be a fiction and so that's why it's a really interesting medium and i really enjoy exploring it in my work of trying to 
get kernels of truth in there for people to engage with because people and I, we've had this conversation before about analog versus digital mm -hmm. um digital of people if you're not in the so, so the photographic community you think a photograph can actually <laughs> It is, it's a truth. And that's why people sometimes will discredit digital photo photography because they think due to Photoshop, we've distorted that truth. And it's like, no. Yeah, the truth has <laughs> always been distorted. distorted. Yeah. <laughs> it's never been a kind of golden age where all photographs just represented actual information. Because but we are at a point where being right is kind of no longer important. It's Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. It is certainly more about a point of view that's more important. Yeah. Than, certainly politically, globally, it's more about this best serves me, therefore I'm doing this. Yeah, um, there was a really interesting photo book called Universe. I unfortunately can't remember the name of the photographer who did it, but it's called Universe and it's a Dutch photographer and it came out this year and it deals with how do we present empirical information in a post-truth world. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's one of my favorite photo books that I bought this year. Yeah, <laughs> um, that sounds really interesting. In terms of like going back to it, it's not just being about being right. And I think like what you said of that people, it's very much, I'm going to pick and choose what I present because yeah. this is my opinion, but it's come to the point of where with postmodernism, we've almost forgotten that information, like there is empirical truth still. If we don't, <laughs> yeah, exactly. if we don't start to reflect more about how we're changing our environment and that's going to change us, the environment is still going to change us. Like we're not, we're not separate from it. We're still part of the ecosystem system so regardless of what your politics are with there there are going to be consequences yeah and so your opinion about how to go about that is where like subjectivity comes in but it doesn't change the objectivity of it's it's gonna happen that's yeah yeah exactly and i think that's where we are now that's different to maybe where we have been in our history as a species of well yeah. i feel like we kind of we were, we were doing really well up until the enlightenment and then people were like i don't know if i like this <laughs> <laughs> Enlightenment, everyone's been kind of like, I don't know if I like your empiricism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of, how dare you tell me that there might be something out of my own experience yeah. of what it is to be human? Yeah. Yeah, the Enlightenment, um, I still think it's this, like, it's still for me the golden age of humanity. And in terms of kind of science, it's got a darkness to it, especially, mm -hmm. um. Well, all the scientists at that yeah. time were also grappling with it. It's like, okay, I've been raised to know all this information and, you know, God's in charge and all this different stuff. But now I'm discovering that all of those things aren't true. And it's like, do I want to accept that and move yeah. forward? And I think we're at that point again. Like, I think there's probably been no point since that point where we haven't been there mm. but we're at a point where the consequences for not listening to it are going to be much more severe but then saying that the earth will still be here yeah the earth is going to be here that's um that's like again coming back to this idea we're just going to go to mars and it's going to be like <laughs> it's just this kind of this is it's very corny but there's um this idea if you can't love yourself how are you going to love someone else and it's kind of like if you can't look after your home planet how the hell do you think you're going to create and sustain life on another planet and it's, it's interesting how things kind of intertwine like that but like with the enlightenment um i do see a lot of kind of artists in the zeitgeist dealing with even here like um i talked to i asked kate that question during the artist talk about mm -hmm. The looking back, like, um, back to the future, like, looking back at the 19th century and kind of, like, how – and those technologies. And, like, again, with Kate's work, what's interesting is that she's done that and she's also deconstructed some of the colonial baggage in it. And we're at a point now where I think that's really important because some – of the information that was out there in the world that we weren't listened to because listening to because it didn't come from authority figures that we were able to recognize as authority figures due to our Western bias. Yeah. Um, and so again, coming back to using backburning as a method to control pests instead of using a pesticide um, consigning, um, con containing chemicals which are just going to poison the environment and the people around it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know if that's the good note to finish on, but... Everybody dying. Dying. Um, <laughs> there's still hope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's lots of scientists doing lots of really important research into how we can turn things around. Mm -hmm. It's just about getting ourselves into a mindset where we actually want to engage politically, where we can, for instance, get them funding. We can get their voices heard. We can um, get those kernels of truths out there. I think yeah. it's also a willingness to accept changes. Yeah, that's something that it's so interesting as a human 
we don't want to change. And I know that um, the series that I exhibited here a couple of years ago mm-hmm. with you, that's what that was really about, like entropy, like the universe, <laughs> it changes, you can't escape it. And you can either try and stay rooted in and try and stay stagnant and refuse to kind of engage with what's happening around you, but it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's still gonna, <laughs> like, the world is gonna keep on going. Um, and so you can choose to go with it or kind of be wiped out by it. It's. Let's just hope it's the fall. Well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it was really good talking with you, Sophie. I guess I learned a lot today, actually. It was really nice. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> That was the third of three interviews that we recorded during Berlin Art Week and the European Month of Photography 2018. I'm working out how I can streamline the post-production so it isn't months waiting until I upload each of the interviews. Coming up soon is a series of interviews with the artists who took part in our recent postcard salon, so keep an ear out for those. In the meantime, please follow us on social media at the links below and look out for the next episode of Subtext and Discourse.